What if the most feared weapon of the Viking Age wasn't the axe, the shield, or the warrior, but a wooden ship so advanced that no European power could understand how it struck, disappeared, and returned like a phantom on the tide? Long before medieval kingdoms built navies or coastal defenses, something strange began happening around the shores of Europe. Entire villages claimed they could hear ghosts on the water, a low wooden whisper across the waves moments before warriors emerged from the mist. Only later would scholars understand that this sound came not from spirits, but from a revolutionary vessel engineered in the cold fjords of Scandinavia. The Viking longship wasn't simply a boat. It was a weapon system, an instrument of movement so precise, so counterintuitive, that historians today still puzzle over how an early medieval society achieved it. The surprise is even greater when you consider this. The earliest longships appear long before large-scale written records, yet they show design principles we now associate with modern naval architecture, flexibility under wave stress, distributed load, shallow water dominance, and hydrodynamic balance. And buried in the Oseberg, Gokstad, and Thun ships each discovered a thousand years after they sailed. We've learned the truth. These ships were much more than raiding tools. They were cultural identities, expressions of engineering intuition, and the foundation of the Vikings' outward-facing worldview. But the question remains, how did a people with no blueprints build something that changed the map of the world? Scandinavia was a world shaped not by gentle seasons, but by ice. Glaciers carved deep scars into the land, slicing the coasts into narrow fjords, and breaking the interior into a maze of mountains, bogs, and frozen passes. Overland travel was not merely slow, it was dangerous. In winter, it could be fatal. So the early Norse made a choice that set them apart from the rest of Europe. They stopped fighting their landscape, and began listening to it. If the land was impossible, the water would become their road. Villages clung to shorelines like strings of lanterns. Families traveled by boat, traders moved goods by boat. Even leaders crossed fjords and inlets to negotiate alliances by boat. Water wasn't an obstacle. It was freedom. By the 4th century, Germanic shipbuilders were already experimenting with clinker-built planks overlapping layers of timber that flexed like ribs beneath a living creature. But by the 8th century, something remarkable happened. Technique became intuition. Intuition became mastery. They began building vessels that could survive the wrath of the North Atlantic, yet float in rivers barely deeper than a man's knee. Ships that glided silently between islands, hid inside coastal shadows, and appeared where no enemy expected them. Centuries later, Europeans would describe these ships as impossible. But for the Norse, they were simply the next step in turning a harsh world into an advantage. And they carried within them one more secret, one so subtle that no enemy recognized it until the moment it was already too late. Most ancient ships were built like fortresses, heavy, stiff, unyielding. They tried to resist the sea, and the sea punished them for it. But Viking longships were something entirely different. Their clinker-built planks overlapped like fish scales, creating a living, breathing hull that bent with the motion of the waves. Instead of fighting the ocean, it moved with it. Modern engineers have a name for this. Longitudinal flexion. A structural trait so advanced it wouldn't reappear in Europe for nearly a thousand years. This flexibility changed everything. It meant a Viking ship could ride out storms that shattered heavier Mediterranean vessels. It meant fewer rowers were needed, because the hull cut through water with the ease of a blade through silk. And it meant these ships lasted longer, surviving brutal usage that would have splintered other wooden craft. When the Oseberg ship was discovered, archaeologists were stunned. Its curves were too elegant, its carvings too intricate they assumed it had been ceremonial a royal showpiece never meant to meet the open sea. But the timber told the truth. Stress lines along the keel. Wear patterns hidden beneath the decorative edges. Chemical traces showing exposure to salt, wind, and time. The Oseberg wasn't fragile. It wasn't symbolic. It was a seasoned traveler of harsh northern waters. And this single innovation, this quiet, almost invisible flexibility, allowed the Vikings to do what no other society of their age could. Push into the open ocean, survive its violence, and turn the sea itself into a weapon.
Here is where the story becomes truly frightening. A Viking longship drew only 20 to 30 inches of water less than the depth of many backyard canoes. It looked insignificant on paper. But this tiny measurement broke empires. With such a shallow draft, a longship could slide straight onto an open beach without docks, piers, or permission. It could slip into narrow inlets, marshes, and tidal flats where no European navy could follow. It could race up river, vanish around a bend, and reappear miles inland long before defenders even realized the coast was under attack. This is how Viking ships reached Paris. This is how they burned London, York, and Dublin. This is how they carved a highway through the river arteries of Russia and pushed all the way into the heart of the Byzantine Empire. While European armies relied on cavalry, marching columns, and fortified towns, the Vikings bypassed every one of these defenses with a simple, devastating truth. The sea was their road. And every river was an open door. If you step back and think about it, the longship wasn't merely a boat. It was the medieval equivalent of a helicopter, fast, flexible, able to land almost anywhere without warning, without preparation, without resistance. A vehicle that changed the rules of warfare before Europe even realized the rules had shifted. And yet, this astonishing mobility was only part of the terror. Because the longship carried another innovation one so unexpected, so counterintuitive, that medieval chroniclers feared it even more than the silhouette of a sail rising out of the dawn mist. In the 8th century, the Vikings unveiled something bold, something that should not have worked in the brutal, wet, wind-lashed North Atlantic. A massive rectangular wool sail. And here's the bizarre part. Wool absorbs water. It grows heavy. In theory, it should have been deadweight useless in a world of freezing rain, sleet, and storms. But Viking weavers refused to follow theory. They followed experience. They soaked wool in lanolin-rich oils, then wove it so densely that the fibers locked together, forming a surface that repelled water while still catching wind. The result was a miracle of early engineering. A storm-proof engine of movement. With this sail, long ships could power through gales, hold steady against shifting currents, and reach astonishing speeds 12 to 15 knots under the right winds. It was enough to make the impossible possible. A voyage from Norway to Iceland in less than a week. Supporting all of this, was the Kielsen. A massive internal beam that acted like the ship's spine. It transferred the violent pull of the sail across the hull, preventing the catastrophic failures that plagued Mediterranean triremes in rough seas. In a single innovation, the Vikings changed their destiny. They were no longer bound to fjords or coastlines. They were no longer raiders of opportunity. They became navigators of open oceans, able to leap from continent to continent carving new paths across waters Europeans believed uncrossable. And from that moment on, the map of the world was no longer a limit. It was an invitation. By the year 900, Viking ships were touching coastlines that medieval Europeans didn't even know appeared on the map. Iceland, Greenland, and astonishingly North America, centuries before Columbus was even born. Modern oceanographers have confirmed what the sagas hinted at. These journeys would have been impossible with the heavy, deep-hulled ships of the Mediterranean. Those vessels fought the sea, the longship rode it. Skimming across wave crests instead of plowing through them, the Viking ship turned long-distance travel from a desperate gamble into a practical, repeatable reality. And once again, we're faced with a question most history books never truly answer. Why did the Vikings chase the horizon while other kingdoms fortified their borders and looked inward? Some scholars point to climate pressure, harsh winters, shifting resources. Others look to trade walrus, ivory, furs, amber, new markets. But many historians argue something deeper, something psychological. That the Vikings saw the sea not as a barrier, but as an invitation. A pathway. A challenge worth answering. The longship didn't just carry them across the ocean. It shaped how they understood the world. It forged a mindset of motion, curiosity, and possibility. And this leads to a part of the story most people forget. The longship wasn't only a weapon of raids. It was a diplomatic vessel, a merchant ship, a cultural signature recognized from Ireland to Byzantium. And carved into its prow, sometimes fierce, sometimes graceful, 
was a detail that revealed exactly what the Vikings believed about themselves and the world they sailed into. Historical sources describe Viking longships not as neutral vessels, but as moving symbols of fear. Some were coated in black tar that glistened like wet obsidian. Others were streaked with red or bright ochre, turning the hull into a banner of warning long before the crew set foot on shore. Shields lined the gunwale in perfect symmetry, forming a wall of color that doubled as armor and advertisement. And then there were the carved heads, dragons, serpents, wolves, creatures pulled from myth and nightmare. They weren't random decorations. They were messages. Now imagine yourself as a monk on the English coast. The sky is pale with first light. The tide murmurs against the rocks. Then you hear it a rhythmic pulse of oars cutting water, steady, deliberate, coordinated. You step outside. Through the morning fog, a silhouette forms. Not just a ship, but a beast. A towering prow crowned with a snarling wooden creature, its painted eyes glowing through the mist. In that moment, the Vikings have already won half the battle. This wasn't merely warfare. It was theater. Psychology. A carefully engineered moment meant to freeze the mind before the sword ever rose. Here's the part most people don't know. Many of these figureheads were removable. Approaching friendly shores, the Vikings took them down to show peace. Approaching enemies, they raised them high. A flexible symbol for a flexible ship. A weapon of timber, wind, and fear. Designed not only to strike fast, but to strike the imagination long before the first blow. Life aboard a Viking longship was anything but comfortable. The warriors lived shoulder to shoulder, packed into a narrow wooden world where every plank had a purpose. Loose decking, concealed plunder, weapons, repair tools, and the small, precious stores of food that sustained them on long voyages. At night, the crew curled beneath wool blankets or rough awnings, drawing warmth from shared body heat and from shields positioned to block the icy wind. Rowing benches doubled as sleeping spots. Nothing was wasted. Nothing was fixed. The longship was an open, communal space part barracks. Part battlefield. Part home. This design created something that armies on land rarely achieved. True brotherhood. Every man rode when the sea demanded it. Every man fought when the moment came. Every man depended on the strength, rhythm, and resolve of the crew beside him. Hardship wasn't an obstacle, it was a bond. This shared struggle, day after day, wave after wave, forged Viking crews into some of the most coordinated fighting units in medieval Europe. Their movements were instinctive, their roles interchangeable, their discipline born not from orders but from survival. Yet the longship shaped far more than warriors. It connected worlds. From the Arctic North to the markets of the Mediterranean, these vessels carried ideas, goods, people, and power. They stitched together river systems, coastlines, and distant kingdoms into a single web of influence. The longship wasn't only a machine of war, it was the backbone of a network that reshaped continents. While Western Europe feared Viking sails on the horizon, Eastern Europe faced a different kind of threat. One quieter, more transformative, not coastal raids, infiltration. From the Baltic Sea, Viking longships slipped into the river systems of what is now Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Their shallow draft let them move through narrow waterways no other fleet could enter. And when rivers grew too shallow, the Vikings lifted their ships from the water and dragged them across the land, hauling them over portages to reach new tributaries and new worlds. This mobility didn't just open routes, it reshaped history. Along these inland passages, Norse traders and warriors forged alliances, collected tribute, built trading posts, and eventually formed a new political identity, the Kievan Rus. A state shaped by river travel as much as by any battle. Farther south, the Byzantine Empire met another face of the Norse. These northern fighters now seasoned sailors of rivers and seas became elite mercenaries in the emperor's service. The Varangian Guard, crossing the Black Sea in their longships, gained a reputation for fierce loyalty and relentless strength. The longship had evolved from a coastal raider into the backbone of trade, diplomacy, and influence across half of Europe. And yet, after all these journeys, one question remains. 
What made the longship truly terrifying? What allowed it to claim imagination as easily as it crossed the sea? To understand that, we must return to the heart of its design, and to the secret that endured for a thousand years. The Viking longship was terrifying for one simple reason. It violated every expectation of its age. It was fast in a world of slow, lumbering vessels. It was quiet when other ships groaned and splashed. It slipped through shallow waters while enemy fleets required deep harbors. It bent with the waves when rival hulls cracked beneath them. In every way that mattered, the longship was an anachronism, a technological leap so bold, so counterintuitive, that it seemed to belong to a different century entirely. And here is where the story comes full circle. The very design principles that made the longship unstoppable in the year 900, its lightweight hull, its flexible frame, its shallow draft, are the same principles modern naval architects study today. Search and rescue boats, river patrol craft, high-speed coastal vessels, all echo ideas first perfected by Norse shipwrights working with nothing but wood, intuition, and the rhythm of the sea. A thousand years later, the longship has not faded. Its influence still hums through maritime engineering, through every craft that glides instead of plows, bends instead of breaks, adapts instead of resists. And that soft, haunting whisper you sometimes hear across the waves, the one legendary monks claimed came from spirits? It isn't a ghost. It's the memory of an idea, an idea so powerful, so perfectly aligned with the forces of nature, that it outlived the kingdoms that feared it, and shaped the world long after those kingdoms crumbled into dust. The mystery we opened with how a wooden ship terrified entire kingdoms now has an answer. It wasn't magic. It wasn't myth. It was mastery. A mastery of wood, water, wind, psychology, and the deep intuition of a people shaped by a harsh world and determined to cross it. The Viking longship didn't conquer Europe. It transformed it. If these journeys into deep time and ancient engineering speak to you, join us here at Prehistoric Shadows, where we explore not just what our ancestors built, but why humanity keeps pushing beyond the horizon. The longship is only one chapter. The rest of the story, the human story, is still waiting in the shadows.